everybody. I am Lori Cook, um, and Adam's going to be joining us a little bit later. Uh, we're going to talk about some connection design examples today. Um, I would assume most of you have already seen the course description, uh, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here, but it is available here in our slides as well. Let's see if it wants to advance for me. Okay, there we go. Uh, this presentation is accredited by AIA. Uh, and here we go. All right, here's the interesting stuff now, our learning objectives. Uh, you guys probably saw these before you signed up as well. Uh, so we're going to be talking about withdrawal and shear loading using the NDS and some software-based solutions. And here's a brief outline. So I'm going to provide a little bit of background, talking about the NDS, some of the um, important provisions for the connection design within the NDS. Uh, then we're going to jump into some withdrawal examples. Withdrawal meaning the force is applied parallel to the length of the fastener. Then after that, we'll follow with some shear examples. So that would be shear, it's sometimes called lateral loading as well, where the force is applied perpendicular to the length of the fastener. Uh, and then we'll turn it over to Adam for the last bit, and he's going to go through some examples using the Woodworks software. So we're going to start with our first poll. So Marcy will bring that up for us. And this one is really easy because there's no wrong answer. It's just what is your profession? Absolutely. And we have this one always, so this is not a surprise. But go ahead and vote. And as usual, I give you about 30 seconds and wait until about 80% of you have voted. So we like to get an idea of who our audience is. I have a feeling I know what the, the bulk of it's going to be, but we'll yeah. see what the results give us. All right, folks. I I'm not getting my 80% that I like, but it has been oh. about 30 seconds. Oh, there, there we go. We just got there's it. a little lag today. The uh, GoToWebinar is lagging. So I'm going to close. I noticed that as well, so we'll try so, to work with that. Yeah. All right. Let me share the results. We've got 80% engineers, 11% um, building official, 5% architects and others. So welcome to all of you. We are so happy that you're here. And I'm going to go ahead and hide this and give it back to you, Lori. All right, great. I anticipated most of you folks would be engineers, but that's all right. I think we have some things uh, in here as well that will be useful for building officials and architects as well. So. So when you go into the 2015 NDS, uh, mechanical connections, the primary uh, overarching chapter for the design of mechanical connections is going to be chapter 11. So um, chapter 11 is going to be your primary design issues. It's going to tell you where to get reference design values for the different connectors that are included in the NDS. Uh, as well as some adjustment factors that are relevant. So if you look at uh, our list here, you see there are, are actually three different chapters that deal with specific types of connectors. So today we're only going to deal with DAO type connectors. So that's going to be stuff that's going to be included in chapter 12. Um, we, we hopefully next year we'll have a, a, another one of these and get into split rings and, and timber rivets and some more exa um, advanced connection examples. But today we're just going to deal with chapter 12 dowel shaped connectors. So that's going to be nails, uh, bolts, and then lag screws or wood screws. Now, those of you that are familiar with the NDS will recognize uh, table 1131 here. This is uh, something that we have in a lot of chapters in the NDS, it's our uh, adjustment factors table. So you've got one of these for solid on lumber, glue lamb, eye joists, and, and the like. Uh, so this is what it would look like for connections. Where we are going to be dealing today, as I said, we're going to be dealing with withdrawal loads and uh, lateral loads for dowel type fasteners. So the withdrawal loads, you can see, 
are uh, in this bottom row here, and that would give you your W value, which is your withdrawal basis value. Uh, and then the lateral loads we're going to be calculating for dowel fasteners will give us this Z value. So those are going to be the two that we're going to be dealing with primarily today. So when you go into Chapter 12, they have there are, is a listing of various equations for withdrawal for different dowel type fasteners. Um, all of these, so you can see here on this slide, the equations are all different, which makes sense, but they are, are all going to be dependent upon two things. The specific gravity of the material that the connector is going into, so the wood, and the diameter of the fastener. So that's going to be the two important values for withdrawal capacity for any of these fasteners that we use in, in Chapter 12. Now, when we talk about withdrawal penetration, um, there is there are some things that, that are a little different depending on the type of fastener. And one of those deals with when we have fasteners that have tapered tips. So that's going to include nails and spikes, lag screws and wood screws. So when we use when we do the lag screws, when we calculate the penetration for lag screws, we do not include the length of the tapered fastener tip in that penetration. However, for wood screws and nails and spikes, we do include the length of the tapered fastener tip in the penetration. So when we go into chapter 12, table 12-2A, for example, this is going to be a tabulated uh, a table, tabulated results for the lag screw reference withdrawal design values. So I remember we said that the equation was dependent upon specific gravity and the diameter of the fastener. So for lag screws, you can see here uh, underneath the table heading, the length shall not include the length of the tapered tip. Um, and this is not the whole table. This is just a portion of it. So we just wanted to fit it on the slide. Obviously, we have members with a lower specific gravity than 0.47. But you can see our, our lag screw diameters we have from a quarter inch on up to uh, an inch and a quarter in diameter. So I have two withdrawal examples here that we've prepared. There's one for a smooth shank nail and one for a lag screw. So let me just get those up. So here's so I prepared these examples in MathCAD. Um, we're not going to make the MathCAD sheets available. I know when we do MathCAD examples, oftentimes you guys ask if you can have them. Um, we're not going to make the MathCAD sheets available, but uh, you do have the PDFs available um, in the, the link that Brian has shared in the chat box. So if you guys want these, ma these uh, MathCAD sheets, the PDFs are in the handouts for the, the um, slides. So this is a pretty basic example here. We're just going to calculate the ASD reference withdrawal capacity for an 8D common uh, plain shank nail. So we're assuming the main member is a nominal 4 by SPF. So that would give us an actual dimension of 3 and a half inches. We have a 12 gauge steel side member. Uh, you can see the actual thickness there is 0.105 inches. And then the dimensions of the nail we can get out of NDS table L4, which is in Appendix L. And that's where you'll have several different um, tables for different types of fasteners and their dimensions. So we go into table L4 and we can determine that an 8D common nail has a length of two and a half inches and a diameter of 0 0.131 inches. All right. So we've got those values. Um, the specific, if we're not sure the specific gravity of our species, you can go into NDS table 12331A. That will provide it. Um, but so we calculate our penetration into the main member. Now remember we said for nails, we do we do include the length of the taper tip in that penetration. So our penetration for this is just going to be uh, 2.395 inches. We're only um, subtracting the length of the thickness of the side member. So plugging those values into NDS equation 1223, 
we get a value of 21 pounds per inch. So what this W value represents is the reference withdrawal value for that nail in pounds per inch of penetration. So what we need to do now is multiply this W that we've calculated times the penetration, uh, which we calculated further up in inches. And then that'll give us our, ref our resistance value, which we've calculated here as 49 pounds. Um, and as you can see, this W of 20.7 that we calculated, we compared that to uh, NDS table 12.2C, which gives us 21 pounds per inch. So uh, you can see the tables, we haven't done anything special with those. We've just taken the equations and presented them in a tabular format. So you don't necessarily need to run this calculation every time you're doing a withdrawal equation. You can just use the table. So um, we didn't we didn't specify all of the adjustment factors. So, you know, we didn't really talk about load duration um, or wet service or anything like that. So those can have an impact on that value of 49 pounds uh, for our connection. We would just have to adjust it based on the actual conditions of that connection. All right. So that's our smooth shank nail with 49 pounds of resistance. Now let's take a look at our lag screw. Again, uh, in a similar uh, problem statement, we're just going to calculate the withdrawal capacity uh, for our lag screw. So we're assuming this one, we have a main member that's uh, a southern pine nominal six by. So the actual dimensions are going to be uh, it's going to be five and a half inches thick a side member uh, we assume the side member is a nominal two by so the actual thickness for that's going to be an inch and a half and both of these are southern pines so the specific gravity is 0 0.55 uh, we said this was a lag screw we're using a half inch diameter lag screw and we got the we can get the tip length out of uh, NDS table L2. Again, that's in Appendix L. Now, remember on the nail example, we didn't have to worry about the length of the tip because that was included in the penetration. However, for the lag screw, we don't include the tip length, so we need to pay attention to what that is because it's going to be important later. So we've set our we've set our our um, geometry of our. Uh, fastener as well as the specific gravity of the wood uh, four inch lag screw so calculating the penetration then we subtract the thickness of the side member as well as the tip length of the lag screw so our penetration is 2.188 inches 2.2 um, NDS equation 1221 here again we, we saw that earlier uh, and we then can calculate that to 436.6 pounds per inch. Com uh, we are going to compare those to the NDS value, uh, which gives us a value of 437 pounds per inch. Uh, so we're right in line with what the table had. Uh, and calculating our resistance then, we just multiply our W value times the penetration in inches. Uh, comparing that to our online connection calculator, we get equivalent results of 955 pounds. Um, and I do see some, some of you noting that the uh, first e example that you have in your notes might have slightly different values. That is correct. I found an error in that. Um, so if you haven't downloaded if you downloaded the slides before about mid-morning today, um, your examples will be slightly different uh, because I did note an error. So that was corrected uh, earlier today, and the updated slides that are on the website now have corrected that error. So just want to make you guys aware of that. All right. So that's withdrawal. So that is where we applied the force again that was parallel to the length of the fastener so now we're going to talk about shear or lateral loading where the load is going to be applied perpendicular 
to the length of the fastener. So if you go into uh, NDS table 1231A, you'll see these, these yield modes, yield limit equations rather listed. So we have six yield equations and four yield modes. So you'll see mode, mode one, we have a 1M and a 1S for a main and side member. And mode three, similarly, we have a 3M and 3S. So there's six yield equations, but four yield modes. Um, these equations here we have are shown for a single shear. Uh, there are also double shear connection equations, and I'll show you guys a slide, the next slide that shows some of the differences. Um, but you can use these equations for wood to wood connections, wood to steel, or wood to concrete, as long as you have the the input values, the, you know, the, the bearing properties of the material, then you can use these equations. Um, one caveat of these equations, one limitation, uh, is that the members need to be in contact at the shear plane, so they have to be touching each other. So if there are gaps between the members, then these equations would not be valid. You would have to use something else. Uh, we are going to talk about an, one option for that uh, in a little bit here. So, but here are our connection yield modes. So we talk about, we had four yield modes. Um, single shear connections here are shown on the left. So we have six yield equation, or yeah, yield equations for our four year yield modes. For double shear equations, we don't have to use, uh, we don't have to apply mode two or mode 3M. Now that's only for double shear equations. Those are not failure modes that are observed in double shear connections. So we don't have to, to use modes 2 or 3M for double shear, but we do have to apply them for single shear. So for single shear, we've got mode 1M and 1S again. Those are where you have a bearing dominated yield of the wood fibers. Mode 2 is where the fastener will pivot and you'll have localized crushing. Mode three, where we start uh, forming a plastic hinge in the in the fastener, um, and that can either occur, uh, you know, that would either be a main or a side member failure. And then mode four is where we have two plastic hinges that form actually. Um, so again, the double shear connections we only have to we we don't have to do modes two and three M. So with that. We're going to jump into a poll. Yes, we are. All right. So the NDS yield limit equations for modes 2 and 3 sub M do not apply to single shear connections. Is that true or false? All right, about 10 more seconds. If you want to get in there and vote, you got to vote now. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. And then we'll share the answer. All right, so Lori, 72% say false and 28% say true. And the real answer is? All right, well, the majority is correct. It is false. Lori, do you want to take a quick question real quick? Yeah, I think we could, this would be a good time. We could take uh, a couple questions if anyone's got some. Um, okay, yeah, so. as I mentioned earlier, we did we did review this. So double shear connections, we only have to, we can neglect mode 2 and 3M in double shear, not single shear. So we got tricky on this question. But tricky, tricky. Yeah, you know, trying to keep people on their toes. So we got some questions coming in. Yeah, so one question has to do with length of the fasteners. What mm -hmm. length and um, how do they vary between the fasteners regarding so, the tip? Okay, good question. So, and we do, I do have a slide on this a little further up, so I'm not gonna go too far into it, but the NDS does have provisions. So for nails and wood screws, the I think it's for wood screws as well, the length of the tapered tip will be considered to be two fastener diameters. 
For lag screws, um, the tip is going to be dependent upon the, the size. So you can look that up in NDS Appendix, uh, Appendix L and it will list the tip length along with the other geometric properties of the lag screw. So that would be, you know, in NDS Appendix L um, for wood screws, lag screws, and nails. For proprietary fasteners, you'd need to consult with the manufacturer because those would be different, obviously. But that's a great question. Okay. Okay, one more quick question. Yeah. One per um one came well, a few came in regarding the calculations that are being shown, the hand calculations. Mm -hmm. Are there tables within the NDS that can provide a answer that is based on this methodology? So yes and no. So if you if we let's bounce back into I got my lag screw. This is the lag screw withdrawal example here. So if you go into here, uh, we see that we calculated this W value of 436.6 pounds per inch. Now that is, that is something that is tabulated and we've got a note here where we've compared that uh, to NDS design table 12-2A. So that will give you the withdrawal on a pounds per inch basis. What you will then need to do is determine how much penetration you have, and you mm -hmm. multiply that W value from the table by your penetration, and that will give you your actual resistance, which is what we've done then further down here. Great, thank you very much. Awesome, great questions. Okay. Okay, can you see my slide? There we go, it should be up now. Okay, so we talked about withdrawal where the fastener was being loaded parallel to the length of the fastener. So now let's talk about lateral loading or shear loading. Um, so this is where we are loading the fastener perpendicular to its length. Uh, in, one of the important properties for calculating the shear capacity is going to be the dowel bearing strength. So for wood products, uh, for solid sawn lumber, um, the, the dowel bearing strength is listed in table 1233, uh, but it does vary. So when you have fasteners that are less than one quarter inch in diameter, your F sub E is uh, going to be uh, constant. It does not vary with the size of the fastener. It's going to be based solely on the, this equation here which is 16,600 16, times G to the 1.84 power. So that is our dowel bearing strength for fasteners less than one quarter inch in diameter. Now for fasteners that are larger than a quarter inch in diameter, it's gonna vary dependent upon both the fastener size and the orientation to grain. So for members uh, parallel to, and you can see a portion of that in this table here where we've got uh, FE parallel listed for fasteners between one quarter inch and an inch in diameter. Uh, and then when you have perpendicular to grain loading, it will vary depending upon the fastener diameter. Table 12.3b also has some additional dowel bearing strengths for wood structural panels. Uh, there's also some additional information in technical report 12, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Um, so there are other sources for this. If you don't have it for your wood product, uh, you can check with the manufacturer for proprietary products as well. Um, but so this is this is one possible source of information. It's not the only one. Fastener bending yield strength is another uh, input that we use in those uh, those lateral yield equations. Uh, and this bending yield strength for fasteners is uh, determined much like many other materials, they use a, uh, a, a load set, you know, load test where we support it, uh, simply support it and apply a load. Um, this is going to be done in accordance with uh, ASTM F1575. Uh, but if you don't have access to ASTM 
five and you don't feel like doing a load test, uh, there's several sources for the fastener bending yield strength. So NDS Appendix I, uh, you can see a, an excerpt from that here that has some value. TR12, uh, Technical Report 12, Appendix A, uh, which is also another document of ours on our website. They'll, that, that provides some additional sources for information that is um, not included in the NDS. You can also check with the manufacturer of your product, especially if it's a proprietary product. Uh, the manufacturer may be your best bet. If your product has an ICC evaluation service report, you can use that. Uh, or an ASTM F1667 is also an option if you're using a fastener that is um, standardized per ASTM F1667. So for those of you that have uh, been following along with us uh, at the AWC, in chapter or in uh, 2015, we added a new chapter, chapter 10, which was on cross-laminated timber. Uh, and we also had to make some changes to chapter 12 uh, because CLT is a new product and it's not exactly like uh, other wood products. So when we have dowel fasteners that are installed in the narrow edge, of CLT panels. Are they in end grain? Are they in edge grain? Do we know exactly where they're going to be installed in the fasteners? Um, you know, these aren't, these aren't things that we typically know in the design phase. So instead, what we do is where we have uh, uh, connectors installed in the narrow edge of the CLT panels, if the member is greater than a quarter inch in diameter, we use FE perpendicular for the dowel bearing strength. Regardless of, of where it is, end grain, edge grain, if it's in that narrow edge of the CLT anywhere, we're going to use the FE perpendicular value. If it is less than a quarter inch in diameter, well, we really only have one choice. That's the F sub E value. So we can use that for fasteners that are less than a quarter inch. So that's an important adjustment that needs to be taken for cross-laminated timber. Uh, there's, there are some other adjustments as well. So this is, that, was on the, that was the dowel bearing strength that we just looked at. So now for dowel bearing length, we assume that in the equations that we, in these yield equations, we assume that the member that is containing the connector, the fastener, has a uniform bearing profile uh, throughout the entire cross section. So for things like, you know, glue lamp, solid saw, and uh, LVL products, that's a good assumption. For cross laminated timber, that assumption's not as valid because every other layer is 90 degrees from the one next to it. So you might have w one layer loaded parallel to grain, and then the layer next to it is 90 degrees. So that member is good. That layer is going to be loaded perpendicular to grain. So we have this case where we have this non-uniform bearing occurring throughout the main and side members. So to account for that, what that we will do is for we will apply this adjustment factor on the bearing length of the plies uh, where the, the dowel is being uh, bared on perpendicular to grain. So there's a lot of words in this. It's easier if we can just jump to an example and talk about it this way. So what we need to do is we need to adjust the bearing length based on the fact that not all of these laminations are loaded in the same direction. So for this example, we have a three-ply CLT, Southern Pine CLT. Uh, the, the laminations are one and a half inches thick. So if we just look at the nominal thickness of this panel, it's four and a half inches thick. Um, if we take a look closer, though, we see that so we have layer one, two and three. Layer two being this middle layer that's going to be loaded perpendicular to grain. So we have to take an adjustment on this layer that's loaded perpendicular to grain uh, on the bearing length. So we adjust the thickness of lamination two here, multiplying it by this Fe perpendicular divided by Fe parallel. So we can get those values out of table 1233. So for Southern Pine, it's got a 
specific gravity of 0.55. Uh, and we get our adjusted bearing length is instead is uh, 3.9 inches. So you see we've adjusted it down from the actual value of 4.5 to 3.9 inches to account for that reduced bearing that would be associated with that middle layer that's not being loaded parallel to grain like the other two. All right. So what about dowel diameter? Um, well, for nails, um, you know, we talked about, you know, the tapered tip, but that's only just a little bit. But for threaded fasteners like uh, lag screws and bolts, diameter is not quite so clear. We have the, the unthreaded portion, this, uh, this full body diameter, and then we have the, the threaded portion, sometimes called the, re the root diameter or the reduced body diameter. So when you have these threaded fasteners, how do you account for the, the reduced diameter? And how do you account for the effects of these threads in your connection? Uh, so you can see here at NDS uh, chapter 12.3.7, they provide some guidance on how to determine that. So if our threaded length is less than one quarter the thickness of the main member, then we can use the di the full body diameter, the unthreaded diameter. So you can see that illustrated two different ways here. Now, for bolts, sometimes it's difficult to determine which one is the main member. Uh, so it's not always the member that is thicker. In For bolted connections, the main member would be the member that's supplying the load. For nails and uh, screws, you know, fasteners with a tapered tip, it's a little easier to make that distinction. Your main member is going to be the member that contains the, the fastener point. Um, but for bolts, it's not that distinction is not quite as apparent. So for bolts, remember, the main member is going to be the one that applies the load. Um, so in this case, you can see we, regardless of, of the thickness of the main member, the bolt has to have its threaded length be less than one fourth of that. And in those cases, we would be able to use the full body diameter. So if you aren't in that, if you don't meet that requirement, or if your shear, if your shear plane has threads that run through it, then these would be instances where you would want to use the reduced body diameter, the D sub R value. If you go into the um, lateral tables in chapter 12, we do have uh, values for the, that solve these, these yield equations, so you don't have to deal with them every time. Um, if you look in the chapter 12 tables for lag screws and for wood screws, the NDS assumes the reduced body diameter, that D sub R value. For bolts, they assume the full body diameter. So if you're using a bolted connection and you have uh, your shear plane passing through the threaded section of the bolt, you would want to verify your connection capacity using something other than the NDS tables because that would not represent the connection geometry that your, your connection has. So just be aware of that. All right, so this is something that we had some a quick question about, and I promised I'd get back to it. So this talks about the tapered tip length, or the as and as it relates to bearing length. So um, because there weren't enough variables that used e, we decided to make the the variable for tapered tip length also e. Uh, so that is going to be that's what it's denoted as in the NDS is e. So we talked about the dimensions for that tapered tip for lag screws are in NDS Appendix L. Uh, for wood screws and for nails and spikes, the tip length we assume is just two times the diameter. Uh, and for the wood screws, that's going to be the, the, or the, the full body diameter, not the reduced diameter. So you'll use two times the diameter as the tip length. Uh, we did talk about the bearing length a little bit. So the bearing length for a tapered tip fastener is going to be equal to the penetration minus one half of the tip length. So that accounts for that reduced bearing that occurs as your tip tapers to uh, the, the point. 
there are minimum penetration requirements for fasteners. Um, so for nails, spikes, and wood screws, you do need to have a minimum of six diameters of penetration into whatever members got the, the tip or the point in it. Uh, for lag screws, you, do, you only need to have uh, four diameters of penetration. And again, there's an exception for we have double shear connections with clinch nails that are less than 0.148 inches in diameter. You can use that uh, exception to get around that 60 minimum penetration requirement. So, for example, if you were doing something like, uh, you know, a, a um, truss repair, for example, and you had uh, plywood gusset plates you know, and clinch the nails, that would be an example where you could get away from that 60 minimum penetration requirement. So we talked about Technical Report 12 or TR12 a little bit. It provides some additional tools beyond the provisions that are in the NDS. So this is just going to help us calculate lateral connection values in a different way and provide a little bit more flexibility. So uh, we talked about how the NDS um, connection equations for, for lateral loading assumed that the members are in contact. Uh, so TR12's equations do actually allow for a gap between members at, at the shear plane. Uh, we've got some different bending moment configurations that we show in, in some of the example problems with related to how the, the shear threads, or I'm sorry, the shear plane passing through the threads can affect the, the fastener. Um, some really in-depth stuff on that. We have tables uh, with equations for when you're attaching a piece of wood to a hollow member. Um, so we've got equations that have been developed for both solid and uh, solid main members and solid side members. Um, and then we also have a very detailed um, derivation of the provisions for the fasteners with tapered tips um, and how they compare to that NDS approximation that we, we talked about where we assume the bearing length is the we subtract half the tip length. Uh, the TR12 equations give us a P value. So they're not going to give us the exact same thing that the NDS equations are going to give us unless we divide by this R sub D, this reduction term that's in NDS table 1231. So when we divide the TR12 values by, by R sub D, then we will get something that will be comparable to the NDS values. Uh, TR12 also has an appendix. Uh, so in the appendix for TR12, we've got some design values for different materials that are not included in the NDS, such as uh, stainless steel and aluminum. Uh, we've also got some, some doubt, so that's doubt bearing strengths for various products, um, as well as fastener bending yield strengths for different types of metals. Uh, and that is available for a free publication or free download on our publications website. Uh, you can check it out there, or just navigate there through awc.org. Um, so this is um, using the, the NDS equations for shear. Um, I just ran a quick, I made a, a quick Excel spreadsheet and ran a, an example for a 10D nail that is in a two and a half, uh, or I'm sorry, a three by main member. So it would be uh, actual thickness of two and a half inches uh, and a one by side member. So um, it, I got, uh, it spit out a Z, an unadjusted Z of 121 pounds. So keep that in mind, because we're going to then take the same example and we're going to jump to it in MathCAD. and show a little bit more of the uh, nitty gritty of that example. So uh, this is gonna be, again, we'd said a nominal three by Southern Pine main member and a nominal one by Southern Pine side member. We have a 10D common nail, so the, the dimensions can come out of NDS Appendix L. Uh, so we have our main member and side member dowel bearing strength. These are taken from NDS table 1233. 
and we have to calculate this r sub e value for the uh, yield limit equations. So I, I chose to calculate it up here. Uh, we have an FYB. Again, this is just coming out of NDS table I1, out of the appendix I. Uh, so the FYB is 90,000 PSI. And our nail diameter is specified in NDS uh, appendix L. Here's the NDS provision 12353B that tells us that the tip length is two times the diameter. And then we can just calculate our main member uh, bearing length based on that, for using that provision. So it's the nail length minus the thickness of the side member minus one half the tip length. Now we got to check and make sure that we meet that main member penetra or I'm sorry, yeah, meet that main member penetration of 6D, which for our size fastener would be 0.89 inches. So we are well above that, so we're good. Uh, and then our reduction term is just 2.2. All right, so this is the part where I become very appreciative of MathCAD is when I start calculating my K1, K2, and K3 values. Uh, we have this R sub T value here, uh, which is just a ratio of the main member to side member bearing length. And then we have these lovely equations here uh, that are our K1, K2, and K3 values. So again, that's this is a, a great example where MathCAD really comes in handy for some, some of these calculations because it can be a little bit of a bear when you start trying to, to do that on your calculator by hand. So keeping those K1, 2, and 3 values that we've calculated now, we can carry them into our yield mode equations. So uh, this is a single shear connection, so we do have to check uh, all six equations. So we start with mode 1M and 1S, which are just uh, based on the bearing. And then here we go, mode 2, uh, 2, 3M, and 3S here and mode four. So for this example, you can see then we create an array with all our different values. Uh, and you can see that our controlling mode in this example is gonna be a mode three S value. So if we don't wanna do this, all of this, and we wanna just get it out of the NDS table because we have a connection that works for that, we can go into NDS table 12N and we can see that the value out of NDS table 12N gives us 121 pounds. So that's where that number comes from. Okay. So, so that was a smooth shank nail in single shear. Let's look at a double shear one, just because why not? All right. So, uh, this one I have, if it wants to come up, here we go. So now we have a uh, double shear connection using a wood screw. Um, our main member is going to be, an, so this time it's an actual three inch thick material. So we're using a structural composite lumber member. Uh, which will have a specific gravity of 0 0.5. For our side members, we're using nominal two by uh, Douglas fir, so actual thickness of 1.5 inches. Um, we used a number 10 wood screw, and the uh, d the fastener dimensions again were found in NDS appendix uh, L, table L3, and. We have our main and side member dowel bearing strengths. These are, again, similar to what we had for our nails. And this R sub E value that we use in the yield limit equations. So again, just establishing some of the geometry of the connection. Now, one thing, again, our side member dowel bearing length, we want to subtract half of that tapered tip length. 
So that is something that we include again. Our reduction term on this one, we have an equation to calculate it per table 1231B. So we've got a uh, reduction of or R sub D equal to 2.4. Now, since this is a double shear equation, remember, we don't have to check modes 2 or uh, 3M. So we actually only need to calculate uh, K3. So let me give that a second to catch up. All right, cool, you guys are seeing what I'm seeing. So we only actually have to calculate K3 for this example because we don't need K1 and K2. So again, modes one and two, these are just based on the uh, bearing in the, the wood members. Mode 3S gives us a value of 286 pounds. Mode 4 is 214. So again, we, we create an array um, and determine that actually this time it's actually a mode 4 controlled failures. So unfortunately for double shear connections like this, we don't have anything in the NDS that we can compare it to directly. We don't have tables for double shear. Um, so you, we don't have uh, a direct comparison that we can use, but we could use uh, you know, an, another um, connection calculator to verify or something else that we've created in the past. All right, so. And then our last uh, shear example is going to be a bolt because we haven't really done anything with bolts yet. Um, so let's get this guy up. Okay. Similar problem statement, right? We're just gonna calculate the reference lateral capacity uh, using the NDS yield limit equations. So we're assuming our main and side members are both four by members, uh, hem fur, with an actual thickness of three and a half inches. Um, we've got our bolt is a half inch diameter. It's eight inches long. Uh, and we assume the thread length is an inch and a half. So that's, again, NDS Appendix L. Uh, we do need to check, again, if our threads are less than one quarter of the bearing length in the member that holds the threads. So uh, this one's pretty easy because both of our, our main and side member are the same size. So we only have to, to we don't have to figure out which is which. Uh, so we see that our threads in our, uh, sorry, we see that uh, we have three and a half inches um, of main member uh, that will be unthreaded. So we've got less than, or sorry, we've got three and a half inches over four, which is greater than the half inch of threads that we're gonna be assuming are gonna be in that member. So we can use that full body diameter instead of the reduced body diameter in our calculations. So when we get to, the reduction terms for this, they are actually going to vary depending upon the mode, and that's shown in table 1231B. So that's why we have three different ones here with a, a one, two, and three, and that's just to denote that they will vary. Um, K1, two, and three, again, these equations, they do not get any more attractive every time you look at them. I can assure you of that. Um, but so we calculate them just the same as before. Uh, and then we go into our yield mode calculations. So let's scroll through that and then go down and check out our array that we created. So we create an array we, that we determine that our value uh, for our bolted connection has a Z of 663 pounds, which is a mode four controlled failure. So that's that's all well and good. Um, but say we wanted to go ahead and do the same problem and use the TR12 equations because we looked at TR12 and, uh, you know, we just decided that 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 works better for us for whatever reason. 
So when we do the TR12 equations, we have to calculate some slightly different uh, parameters, but they are going to be based on a lot of the same ones we've used. So for example, for our side member and main member dowel bearing resistance, we calculate the Q sub S or Q sub M value, and that's going to be based on our uh, side and main member dowel, dowel bearing strength um, times the diameter. Uh, we have the dowel resistance, um, so that's the uh, based on the dowel resistance uh, FYB, and then times the diameter of the of the fast yeah the diameter of the fastener cubed. Um, in this equi in this case, it's equivalent because we've got uh, equivalent dowel values in both the side and the main member. So when we look at uh, the, the values that we get out of the TR12 equations, um, those are going to be based th th on the yield model. Uh, so that's, that's looking at this, we're looking at this proportional limit, this curve here. Uh, but then we actually want to use the values in the yield limit equations and Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I had a frog in my throat there. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the wood stresses in this yield model uh, that have been developed on this load deformation curve, and then we use this 5% offset. So it's a 5% of the diameter, of the fastener diameter, that, and we create this parallel line that is uh, parallel to this straight portion of our curve. So the reduction term, that R sub D value that we're using, it reduces the values calculated uh, using the proportional limit down to the values that are used in the NDS editions. And there's a lot more language on this in the NDS commentary that provides a lot more in-depth um, discussion that I can fit in today. But so let's go in and we're going to run those yield mode equations. Um, that are going to come out of TR12. So again, uh, these numbers are not going to match exactly what we got out of uh, the NDS equations because we have not yet applied that reduction term. Now, another nice thing about uh, the TR12 equations is we don't have those K1, K2, K3 terms. Uh, these equations, the solutions for modes 2, 3, and 4 are going to be based off of the quadratic formula. So instead of those big, long equations that we had to, to punch in, this is all that you have to use uh, in terms of solving for mode 2. So it's just the quadratic formula. So modes 2, 3M, and 3S, sorry, 3S, uh, are all solved using this quadratic as well as mode 4. So then what we needed to do is take all of those P values, which represent what we calculated using the TR12 equations, and we need to divide them by the relevant R sub D value. So when we calculate the, the P over R D values, that gives us this Z sub distribution too. Uh, and you'll see, that we get a controlling value of 663 pounds. Now, uh, when we compare the reduced Z dist, you know, uh, from TR12 to the distribution that we calculated here on the left from the NDS, you can see that when after we've divided by that R sub D term, we do get equivalent values. So they give you the same final answer, they are just kind of different paths to the same end. So that is our last shear example. And let me get my spreadsheet back or my PowerPoint back up here. Sorry. OK. So that's those are our shear examples now. So let's take a quick break from all of that math CAD and jump into a poll now. So Marcy's going to bring this one back.
Sure. So technical report 12 can be used to calculate a dowel type connections reference withdrawal design values or its reference lateral design values, combined lateral and re withdrawal reference design values, or its maximum fastener sizes. All right, folks are on top of this one. So we've got about 50% have voted. I'm going to let it go just a little bit longer, probably about 10 more seconds. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close. And then, so we've got, boy, close call between B and C. So 49% say reference lateral design values, 46% say combined lateral and withdrawal re reference design values, and then just a smattering of uh, okay. the other two. So All what right. is the answer? The answer is choice B. So the slim majority was correct. Uh, so this was uh, technical report 12. We can actually only use it for lateral design values. So it doesn't have any provisions for withdrawal. It's only going to give us uh, different equations for that lateral loading. So good for those of you guys that are paying attention for and got it correct. For those of you that uh, didn't get it correct. You're probably still paying attention, but we made that one tricky. So good job. All right. So uh, some of you guys might be looking at the calendar and you're looking at our your 2015 NDS and, and you're saying, you know, you guys, um, you, you're going to be due for a new one soon. And you are correct. We have a 2018 NDS that's coming out. Uh, it should be done within the next few weeks. Um, so there's going to be a, a Good bit of change. Uh, we, uh, we've been working hard, and there's going to be a handful of changes in the connections chapter as well. So this is just a, kind of a sneak peek for those of you guys that are our, our loyal listeners, right? Uh, so we have revised withdrawal equations for deformed shank nails. So that's going to be anything under ASTM F1667, pretty much. Uh, we're going to have roof sheathing ring shank nails included in the standard. We're taking out some of the generic threaded nail provisions. Um, those have been refined and, and changed around a little bit. Uh, so we feel like what is coming will better reflect what's, uh, what fasteners are out there and being used. Uh, we got a new equation for smooth shank stainless steel nails. So that is uh, going to be different for withdrawal than a, a, a carbon, uh, you know, bright nail or, or carbon um, galvanized nail or something like that. Uh, and we also have this new, uh, we looked at 1131 earlier, we're adding this new row to it for fastener head pull through where you have round headed fasteners. So that's going to be probably one of the bigger changes. We do have a webinar coming up uh, in December on the 2018 NDS changes. So uh, I'd greatly encourage any of you guys that are interested in learning more about that to stay tuned. Uh, we'll be promoting that one very shortly. So um, with that, I'm going to take uh, give it over to Adam. He is going to show us some connection solutions using the Woodworks Design Office software. So this is uh, something that might be similar to what most of you guys are using out there. Uh, I know not everyone is quite as in love with MathCAD as I am. But so we'll switch it over to Adam and let him take it away with some uh, review of these examples using Woodworks. Thanks, Laurie. Appreciate that. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me clearly. Uh, so for the last section of the presentation, I'm going to give you an overview, uh, brief overview of the Woodworks Design Office 11 software, uh, specifically with the focus on the on the connections module. So uh, we do have uh, both a Canadian and a U.S. version of the uh, U.S. Or, or of the Design Office software, um, and there's three modules that are included in in the in the package. The first one is the Sizer module, so that was uh, released in 1993. And it focuses only on gravity loads. So you can design uh, single elements, uh, beams, joists, columns, walls, uh, or you can design a whole building up to six stories and uh, apply the loads and the software will uh, run the loads down the building and design the, uh, the elements for you. Uh, we also have the shear wall software, which uh, is a lateral 
uh, design software. So it generates uh, wind and seismic loads as well as distributes the uh, loads through the through the structure. And um, it, it's uh, it, it's it's a uh, one of the um, it was developed in in 2000, so it's a uh, it's still uh, been around for quite a number of years. Um, and we also have the finally the connection software, which I'll talk a little bit more about today. So you can design different wood to wood, wood to steel, and wood to concrete connections. Um, and the database editor, which I'll go into a bit more detail as well about adding custom sections or proprietary products. So all the design procedures uh, in the software follow the NDS 2015, the IBC 2015, and the AISC. Uh, 360-10, uh, specifically for the design of the steel plates, the bolts, the welds, and the washers. So to give you an idea about um, how to use the software and what it looks like, uh, I'm going to go through a couple of the uh, examples that uh, that Laurie presented. Uh, so the first one here we have is the uh, single, sh single shear uh, nail example. And so what you'll notice uh, in the software is you have a taskbar on the top left uh, and you sort of work through this uh, from left to right uh, as you complete the, the inputs and, and populate the specific information. So uh, you're required to populate certain information before you can uh, populate other information. So that's the uh, idea of uh, uh, seeing the, the buttons on the, on the top left. So here we can see that uh, you can select the connection geometry and the connection type uh, by choosing from a list of these uh, isometric drawings. Um, so here we can we can choose this uh, single shear uh, wood to wood connection, uh, but you can also choose your connection types uh, from a drop down list as well. And you can see here we do have different uh, wood to wood, wood to steel, and wood to concrete connection types. So here's the drop down list. So in this case, we'll uh, choose a, um, a lap shear uh, splice member connection. Uh, and when we do that, uh, we can see that uh, now we have the ability to choose between uh, the fastener types. So we have uh, either nails, bolts, or wood screws. Uh, and you can't necessarily uh, use uh, any type of fastener for all the different connection types, but we've only populated uh, the most common fastener types for uh, specific connections. Uh, as well, you can see uh, we offer sort of a brief description uh, of, of what the connection is. Uh, the next step in the design process is to specify the properties of the main member. Uh, so here we can see uh, from the drop-down lists on the left, uh, we can select the different materials. So it, within the software, we have uh, dimensional lumber, uh, built-up lumber, timber material, as well as glue lem, uh, different types of the, of, of the glue lem material, balanced, unbalanced, and uniform glue lem. And depending on the material that uh, you've selected, uh, you'll see that there's different species that are then become available. Uh, and all of these species are linked to uh, the grades, and, and these are all defined uh, within the NDS. And um, these specific uh, materials and species are also uh, linked to the common section sizes that are available. So you can uh, see on the right, these are all the lists of the materials and species and grades. Uh, and section sizes in the database editor, um, but they can be selected uh, with the pull-down menus that you see on the left. Uh, now we can see also we have to do something similar um, by um, specifying what the properties are in the uh, individual uh, um, uh, main member or side member. And so we can see here that each species in the software is actually associated uh, with the specific gravity as defined in the NDS, and the uh, the grade is also associated with the um, uh, the relevant sizes. Um, so we can see here uh, that uh, sorry, not the relevant sizes, but the relevant allowable stresses, um, and then uh, the section sizes are then associated with the actual sizes uh, used in the calculations and the in uh, and the, and the adjustment factors, the size factors uh, that are used in. Uh, in, the, in the calculations. Uh, so we can see here similarly we, we input um, properties for, for the side member here. So in this case we're choosing uh, a, a, a lumber member, uh, southern pine, and uh, a number three grade. Um, but you'll also notice that uh, you can actually 
uh, manually input section sizes, so you don't need to use exactly the ones that are that we've listed in the in the database editor. But you can uh, manually choose your your width and your thickness uh, of your section size if if you so choose, and those would be the actual uh, sizes that you would uh, that you would input. Um, as you see on the right here with the database editor, one other option is that uh, you can actually create your own custom uh, uh, materials and species and grades, and you can. Uh, select the different uh, inputs um, in the database editor. So this is this is good if you want to input proprietary products, uh, engineered wood products like uh, uh, proprietary LVL or LSL or PSL. You can input them this way in the um, in the database editor. So. After we input the uh, the properties of the main member and the side member, we can see here that uh, there's some other uh, factors that we need to uh, input to to perform the design. Uh, one of them is the uh, service condition factor. Um, so whether it's uh, dry or wet in in service and in fabrication, um, as well as the temperature, uh, which affects the temperature factor. Uh, and here we have uh, a fire retardant treated uh, factor. Uh, so some, uh, in some situations, uh, uh, proprietary products will uh, specify a, uh, a reduction factor uh, for a treatment, a fire retardant treatment. And um, this is not um, necessarily specifically included in the NDS, but it's uh, something that we've allowed in the software uh, because we've had requests from users to be able to incorporate that into the calculations. Uh, as well here, we can see that uh, we can input the force uh, for this connection type as well as the load duration and all the different load durations that are defined. So here we can see um, that we have uh, some of the inputs for the specific fastener properties. Um, so in this case, um, there's uh, different types of uh, fasteners that uh, are available. Uh, we have uh, common wire nails, uh, sinkers, uh, box nails, and spikes as well. So um, those uh, maybe the different uh, types of nails uh, can impact the, the yield strength and the ultimate strength of the fasteners. Um, as well, we have uh, different nail lengths that you can choose from uh, the common uh, typical lengths that, uh, that are on the market. Uh, pardon me. And uh, other, some other uh, inputs that we have here. Uh, we, we allow for uh, pre-boring uh, and staggering nails, and these uh, options could uh, potentially affect the required end distances and the uh, and the group action uh, adjustment factors. So the so you'll see as well, the software automatically calculates the minimum uh, edge distances and, and end distances uh, for the user. And but as well, you'll see that there's some uh, uh, some drop downs that are unknown. Uh, so it's possible you can leave uh, some of these as unknowns, and the software will automatically uh, populate them with a value when it does the design. Uh, but you can select, uh, for instance, here you see the spacing. You can select the spacings between the rows and within the rows uh, if if you so choose. So here we can say we can see that um, we have a uh, uh, the, the the preliminary layout of the connection, which uh, which we can see here. There seems to be a little bit of a lag, I think, uh, on the on the slide. So I'll, I'll just uh, go a little bit slower, I think. So here we can see that the software automatically generates a diagram and shows you the dimensions of your uh, preliminary connection layout. Uh, if we continue along in the uh, in the software in the design process, uh, we can actually run the design, and uh, what we'll see in the results is uh, that we have uh, sort of a tabulated summary of the inputs, so the the main member uh, species and grades and, and sizes, um, as well as uh, the, the the specified loads that we've input in and some of the the, the fastener information. Um, So if we if we continue through the results, we'll see that uh, we can actually uh, see the calculated uh, lateral capacity of the connection that we've uh, designed. And so we see here uh, we have a capacity of 120 pounds, and we have the 
um, the, the critical response ratio, which is uh, next to the, the, the lateral capacity, which is just simply the, uh, the, the load over the capacity. Uh, and as well, uh, the software outputs what the adjustment factors are that were used in the calculations. Uh, so the user can then uh, go back and uh, back check any of those adjustment factors in the calculations um, if, if, they, if, they have, uh, if they so desire. So the next one we'll look at is, uh, is a, a single shear bolt example. So um, again, it's uh, uh, similar in, into the single shear nail example in that we, we, we select the same uh, type of connection. So a lap shear wood to wood and two member splice connection. Uh, but in this case, uh, we're going to select the uh, bolts uh, to be used as the fasteners instead of, uh, instead of the nails. And if we go through, um, you'll see that uh, with specifying the properties of the main member here, uh, in the last case, we used a, uh, a southern pine number three. This time, let's say we'll use a hemfer. Uh, and uh, the specific gravity there is automatically uh, um, that in, in, the, in the database. So that's automatically populated uh, for the user, as well as all of the uh, allowable stress values and the MOE value. Uh, for the grade uh, in the combination. And uh, we can see here as well those uh, size factors and the actual sizes that are automatically uh, included in the, in the database when uh, the material, species, and grade are selected. So again, uh, similar, we can go ahead and define all of our different uh, factors uh, in, for, this, uh, for this connection type. A single shear bolted connection uh, and then go ahead and define what the fastener properties are. So here uh, we can see that the, um, I'll just hold for a sec because it seems like uh, it's a bit of a lag on, on some of the uh, slides coming through. So here we can see that the, the bolt diameter uh, screen uh, and there's a few different uh, pull down options. The first one uh, is the um, uh, what is the, the bolt diameter? So we have all the uh, the, the, the typical diameter bolts uh, in, in, the, in here. And uh, again, you can leave some of these uh, options as unknown if you'd like, uh, and the software will automatically populate, or you can, um, you can choose a, a value here uh, if you so desire. So again, um, similar with the, uh, the preliminary layout of the connection before we uh, run the design. And uh, what we can see here uh, is the uh, sort of the echoing of all of the inputs that we've provided. Um, so we can uh, make sure that we agree uh, with everything that we've uh, inputted into the design. And uh, here's the results of, the, uh, of this connection type here. Uh, we see for, uh, for this one, for the, the bolted connection specifically, uh, the software is actually checking the tensile capacity of the net, of the net section uh, for both the main member and for the side member. Uh, and it's also going to check the row tearout and the group tearout uh, uh, effects when this is applicable. Uh, so we can, as we can see, uh, it does that for both the main and the side member. Uh, also checks the, uh, the yielding resistance. So this is what we went through in the example previously. Uh, and we come up with this uh, lateral capacity of this connection, 664 pounds. Uh, also, the uh, adjustment factors here are then uh, echoed in the, in the output. Um, but what we can see here is that um, the, the individual yield limit values are, are shown so that the designer knows exactly which one is the governing uh, yield mode, uh, and they can then determine uh, if this is indeed a ductile or a brittle failure mode, if that's appropriate uh, for, for their design situation. So the last example I'm going to go through is, uh, is a, a lag screw withdrawal example. Uh, so in this case, uh, what we'll do is we'll choose a beam to beam uh, one sided uh, connection. Uh, and again, you can choose that through the isometrics or through the tabular uh, approach. And for this specific uh, connection type, uh, there's uh, different fasteners that are offered. So uh, in the software, we can either use a shear plate 
uh, fasteners here uh, with with the through bolts, or we can just use a bolted connection, uh, or or we can use uh, a top hanger um, that's uh, that has uh, it's it's a welded uh, top hanger connection or a lag screw connection here. So uh, what we'll do in this case is we will use the uh, the lag screw connection. And again, uh, a small uh, bit of text that uh, tells the user exactly uh, how the connection is uh, is outlaid. So in this example here, we'll use for the main member uh, a six by six Southern Pine and number three. Uh, and uh, for the uh, side member, uh, we'll use a two by six uh, Southern Pine number three. Again, with all those properties uh, already populated uh, through the database for you. Uh, from those tables uh, in the NDS. So again, putting in our uh, different uh, different factors, uh, and here we can see uh, at the bottom uh, that uh, we, we do have two force inputs in, in this type of connection. Uh, we have a vertical and a horizontal force. So uh, in this case, uh, since we're just looking at the withdrawal, we'll just put a unit load for the vertical force and, and 100 uh, pounds for the withdrawal load. And so those forces, X and Y, they correspond obviously to the diagram on the on the left. So what we can see here is the input of the fastener properties for the lags, um, and also for the bolts too. Um, so on the left we have uh, input of, of the of the lags, and we have all the different um, typical sizes for the the lag screw diameters, um, as well as the lag screw lengths. Uh, but you also have to put in the, the inputs for the bolts. Uh, if, if indeed you can let the software do all the design for you, if you leave it as unknown, or you could do the input yourself for um, the bolted connection, the, the bolt uh, connecting to the uh, to the hanger, the purl into the hanger. So here we can see uh, in this one, it's a little more complicated uh, connection uh, that you would potentially want to maybe um, export this connection. So what you could do is, uh, in the software allows you to export as a DXF file, and the uh, DXF can then be read by a CAD program, and uh, you could potentially uh, take these uh, these dimension drawings uh, here and include them in the typical details uh, of the structural drawings. So that's uh, an option that uh, you can use to actually export these uh, these drawings from uh, the Woodwork software into the CAD program. Uh, so here we see uh, some of the output for the one-sided beam-to-beam lag screw connection, uh, and what we're seeing here in some of the of the results uh, is actually we're doing some of the steel design checks as well. So at the bottom here um, of these design results, you can see that um, we're doing. Uh, the tension uh, in the actual lag screw itself, uh, as per the steel design checks and the shear in the lag screw, um, for uh, uh, for that uh, steel design check by the AISC uh, 360 document. And as well, the um, here's some of the, the design results from the NDS, uh, and uh, what we're seeing here. Uh, you know the uh, what is the effective depth we're using, and the lateral capacity and the withdrawal capacity here um, is is what we're we're showing. So both for the for the face plate connector and for the uh, side plate connector, um, uh, we have different uh, different calculation values. And again, uh, echoing the um, the adjustment factors that were used, uh, as well as what are the uh, yield limits uh, for each of the um, of the failure modes that we can now define uh, what is the governing failure mode and if that indeed is a ductile or brittle uh, failure mode. So some of the uh, additional connection types that we have in the software, um, we do have uh, some beam to beam, uh, sort of post and beam style connections. So we have a beam to column connection uh, that you see uh, sort of on the left side here at the top. Uh, we have uh, wood to concrete uh, ledger connections or uh, wood to concrete sill plate connections uh, that you would see on the bottom left here. And, and we also have uh, sort of in the middle this wood to uh, wood, wood column to concrete base connection um, and some, some wood to steel connections. So on the bottom you see we have uh, the uh, knife plate connection, the steel knife plate connection, um, as well as some skewed uh, connection, so a steel plate that's skewed uh, into a wood member. Uh, we're able to to model that and design that in the software. 
So um, there's there's actually is a discount for anyone who is an AWC member uh, for the software. Uh, so there's a few options. You can purchase uh, Sizer uh, just by itself as a standalone, or you can purchase the whole design office together with all three modules of Sizer, uh, the shear walls and the connections and the database editor. So uh, if you have questions about purchase, uh, you can talk to uh, AWC representatives around the discount, as well as uh, the sales uh, line, uh, sales at the Woodworks Dash software. And uh, if you have technical questions, we do have uh, a technical support um, online or over the phone, um, and we can uh, we can walk you through any of the uh, questions you have about using the software or uh, some of the uh, functionalities and the calculations that the software is performing. Uh, so there's also a free demo version, so feel free to go to the website uh, woodworks-software.com uh, and you can download the free demo version of the uh, Woodworks software uh, and test drive it for, uh, for a little bit and see how you like it. So I think we have uh, one final poll here before we wrap up. I do indeed. Um, let's see. So the Woodworks design software, not to be confused with Woodworks, the organization, but Woodworks design software has versions for both U.S. and Canadian standards. Is that true or false? <clears throat> and everybody is on it, so that's great. Got about 70% have voted and 10 more seconds. And I'm going to close and share. All right. And we've got 97% say that's true, 3% say that's false. And the real answer, Adam, is? Yes, it's true. So uh, everybody was listening closely. That's wonderful. So, all right. Great. And I do believe that is my cue to go. Is that right? Adam? Yeah, there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Marcy, you go ahead and um, why don't you run through your slides and then we'll take some time for questions after you finish up. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to put this back over to me. All right, so terrific. Thank you, everybody, for being with us, and thanks, Lori and Adam. I have just a couple quick slides for you all. Um, our partner organization, as I said, is Woodworks, and that is not to be confused with the software that Adam was talking about. Um, Woodworks is an organization, um, our partner organization, that they provide wood project assistance and other resources, um, and, and here on our our slide gives you some of their um, the resources that they provide and if you're interested in learning more about them please go to their website um, and also within the survey that we're putting out after this you can um, list if you'd like to be contacted by them um, for some additional assistance um, so let me go on to our design professional membership um, and if you'd like to join that um, as Adam said, we offer a discount on that um, software. So list the, a list of benefits is listed there as well as on our website. And then Code Official Connections is another program that we have um, specifically for our building officials, which I know there's a few of you in our audience. Um, this is a free program and as a part of this free program, you do get access to that software. Um, and again, um, just as a follow-up that today, um, give us about a half an hour or so to prepare the um, emails that are going to go out afterwards. Note that your certificates of completion will not be immediately available. Um, we've got to process a few things and make sure that you are in attendance for 90% of the time. Again, that's an hour and uh, 21 minutes. So. Um, hang on for a little bit and you, we will get your certificates of completion to you within two weeks. There's also that course survey. We'd love to hear about it. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Okay, the course survey. Um, and then there are other links in there that you're going to want to see. Um, join us again on November 16th for our webinar on cornucopia of classic connection conundrums. And if you have any questions or want more information, just give us an email or shout it excuse me, 
give us a, an email at www.awc.org or education at awc.org. All right, that's all I've got. So I'm going to send you back to Lori and Adam for any questions that you might have. All right. All right, Lori, are you ready for some questions? Some good questions came in. I think so. Okay, there was a question regarding, could you review the, the difference between a main member and a side member related to bolts and lag yeah, screws? Yeah, absolutely. So let's go back to that slide because it's better with the picture. So for... Uh, remember, it's for tapered tip fasteners, so that's, you know. I'm not your, seeing the presentation. Yeah, one second. I'm trying to find the slide. I'm just talking okay. while I'm looking for it. Okay. Uh, so, for, so for tapered tip fasteners, it's really easy. Um, when you've got a single shear connection and a nail or a lag screw or a wood screw, the main member is just going to be the one that's got the, the tip in it, the point. When you have a bolt, it's not quite as apparent. So um, this slide shows two different connections. They look pretty similar, right? The side member is smaller than the main member on both of them. Um, however, it, we assume for a bolted connection that whichever member is applying the load is the main member. So it's not necessarily whichever one is thicker, it's which one is applying the load. So. That, that's not always quite as apparent in, in a bolted connection, so you may need to take a closer look at it to really determine w which one that is. Okay. Another question came in is, can you calculate the capacity for a double shear connection with nails? Um, you can, and the, the same, so it would be the same process that we followed using the wood screw uh, example. Those same equations would apply. You would just use the nail, uh, the dimensions for the nail. So the, the yield mode equations, we did a, we did a single shear example. You mm -hmm. would use table 1231B, or I'm sorry, 1231A, mm -hmm. the equations for double shear, for a double shear connection with any dowel-shaped connector. So uh, the okay. equations will be the same it, even if it's nails or wood screws or whatever, as long as it's a dowel-shaped fastener. And are there tables in the NDS for this? There are some. Uh, the NDS would be an awful lot thicker if we tried to do everything. But so if you go into the 2015 NDS, it starts around uh, page 92. That's going to be the bolts. Uh, is going to be lateral values for bolts. Mm -hmm. We also have some, if you go through that section on through with table 12M or so, um, we've got tables that give you the lateral value for bolts, for lag screws, for some wood screws, and for nails. Uh, again, these are going to be standardized fasteners. They're not going to represent proprietary fasteners, ring shank nails, things like that. Uh, okay. these, are, these are standardized under a relevant ASTM or whatever standard, ANSI standard. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we'll switch it off to Adam Great. Um, if people want to hang around. Um, for the R sub D factor, is that mm -hmm. a factor of safety? It's, it's not really a factor of safety. It's uh, It would be more appropriate to call it an adjustment term. Um, that R sub D value, there, there's a, a much better write-up than I could ever spout off in, in 10 seconds here in the um, hmm. in the NDS commentary. I believe it's going to be in C 12.3 somewhere. Um, so that, that kind of details what the R sub D value is and where it comes from. What it does is it, uh, it adjusts this, the, the yield model equation to a basis that would be comparable with the values that were used before that yield model was developed. Uh, okay. Okay, so Adam, I have a few questions for you. Thanks, Lori. No problem. Is Adam on? Yeah, sure. I'm right here. Thanks, uh, okay. Michelle. Appreciate that. Oh, no problem. So one question came in. Are the It was mentioned that you can edit some of the values, um, the data that's in the calculator. And one question came in about nails. Can you edit the nails if you have a nail that's not included in your database? 
Uh, unfortunately, um, at the moment, we we only have the um, sort of the the typical nails and the the, the lengths and diameters uh, mm -hmm. included. Um, but um, we do have a feature that uh, we're looking to implement around uh, power-driven nails, and uh, oh, okay. we're going to be able to then implement um, uh, this feature where you can put in any. Uh, any diameter that you wish uh, for a nail, and uh, the uh, there is an adjustment uh, factor that's applied for the uh, to to determine what the yield strength is and the um, and the ultimate strength as well. But unfortunately, right. at this present mo moment, there isn't. But it's on the drawing board. Okay, and then also, is there an app available or just the standalone connection software available? Yeah, unfortunately, we only uh, actually offer the sizer as a standalone package. Um, so if you do just want uh, the connections or the shear walls, you have to actually get the whole design office package. Um, but it, it's uh, it's a good point, and uh, you know we have had some demand in the past for maybe web-based or uh, app-style um, um, software. But uh, at this point in time, it's only available sort of uh, um, as a download to, on your uh, on your laptop. Okay, great. And then for the code officials in the audience and students, are is the software available at a discounted price or? Uh, yeah, so I didn't actually mention that, and I should have because there was some building officials on. Is uh, that uh, the software is actually provided for free to building officials, um, and it's also provided for free to uh, educators. So anyone in a college or university uh, program um, it can obtain the the software for free. Um, right. So you'd have to contact uh, the sales uh, at woodworks-software.com in order to uh, organize that, but we do offer that service to the building officials and uh, educators. Great, awesome. And then one last question, um, CLT, is that, um, since it's in the 2015 IBC, is, are you going to have more and more um, software capabilities for CLT? Definitely, yeah, that's a great point, and uh, that's something we're working on. So uh, currently, uh, the Canadian version um, will have CLT in it, and that's scheduled to be released um, probably in a month or so. Uh, but the, and then after the Canadian one comes out well, early next year, we'll start working on the American version for CLT uh, as well. So uh, keep you keep you posted, but it probably in the range of uh, you know uh, eight months to a year, you should be able to see a CLT in the American. Uh, version of uh, the Woodwork software. Great, awesome. I think that I, I just one more quick question you can answer is um, we're doing this webinar on the 2015 IBC and NDS, but some states throughout the country are on earlier versions of the code. You have a 2012 version or? Yeah, we do. We do. Um, it, so we have uh, older versions. So you'll see this is Design Office 11. Um, so the previous versions uh, do comply with earlier versions of the IBC and the NDS. So it is possible um, that you, if you, if you're using an older version, uh, that you can get an older version of the software uh, and use that. Um, uh, we, we would always sort of recommend using the most current one. I'm sure yeah. you would as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, if indeed their push comes to shove, we can uh, help the user to to use an older version uh, of the code. Unfortunately, you can't necessarily switch on the fly between uh, the versions of IBC or NDS uh, in in the, in the in the software. But you can get older yeah. versions. Great. Well, thank you very much, Lori and Adam. It's a great webinar and. Um, I think that about does it for us. We're a little bit past the uh, one and a half hour. Thank you everyone for joining us and we look forward to you joining us in the future for our webinar in November and December. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks.